memories. They say my images are my memories. No, 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 these are not memories. This is all real what you see. Every image, every detail, everything is real. Everything is real and it's not a memory. Not has it has nothing to do with my memories anymore. Memories are gone, but the images are here, and they're real. Uh, what you see every second of what you see here is real, is real. Right there in front of your eyes, what you see, it's real. There, in front of you. Yes, on that screen, it's all real. Who cares about memories? <laughs> no, I don't care about my memories. But I like what I see, what I recorded with my camera. And now it comes back there and it's all real. Every detail, every second, every frame is real. And I like it. I like what I see. Why else would I show it, share it with you, this image? this reality of images. July 19th. 1944. Today, our train pulled into Dirschau, near Danzig. This is our eighth day on the road. I'm neither a soldier nor a partisan. I am neither physically nor mentally fit for such life. I am a poet. Let the big countries fight. Lithuania is small. Throughout our entire history, the big powers have been marching over our heads. If you resist or aren't careful, you will be ground to dust between the wheels of East and West. The only thing we can do, we the small ones, is try to survive somehow. That's why if luck stays with us, we want we are on our way to the University of Vienna. I do not want any part of this war. 
This war is not mine. Many are fleeing Vilnius and Kaunas. The Germans are throwing in more divisions that they cannot ho can't hold the Soviets. The fighting spirit is dropping. The retreat is disorderly. Nearer to the front lines around Birje and Panevegis, there are bands of partisans and German deserters. Those who can put their hands on any weapon run into the woods, hide. Since I have no wish to live in the woods, and what's more, I have no knowledge of guns, my decision is to leave, and the further, the better. If you want to criticize me for my lack of patriotism or courage, you can go to hell. You created this civilization, these boundaries, and these wars, and I neither can nor want to understand you and your wars. Please keep away from me and look after your own affairs. That is, if you still understand them yourselves. As for me, I am free even in your wars. The train is full of refugees. There are about 40 of us in a small car. The train is moving slowly. All rail railroads have been taken by military transports. Uh, for hours and hours, our train waits in the stations. We thought it would take us only two days to Vienna. In Panevichis alone, we waited three days. Now we see how unpractical and unrealistic we are. We took nothing with us when we left, no food of any kind. Others are more practical. They are all eating something. They're all dragging loads of things. One woman who is obviously lacking a few screws in her head is dragging a bunch of artificial flowers, dusty window shades, an empty barrel, and many other such things. Now she is deeply engaged in rechecking them all. She takes each thing, turns it around, puts it back again. She keeps working. That will keep her busy until Neumünster. We crossed Namunas River at Tilsit. I thought of Vidunas and the Bhagavad Gita. I read it first in his translation, and it's the only book that I took with me on the train. This is his town. He must be somewhere out there in one of those little houses. We reached Königsberg at sunset. The setting sun was burning like gold on the steeples of Kant's churches. In the harbor, waters were red with the heat of the day and the rumble of war. The posters shout, Every turn of the wheel is for the victory. Yes, always the wheels. Uh, I look at their faces, good, solid German faces, and I see death. Every turn of the wheel betrays death. The train is moving across the countryside. We are looking at the clean, very orderly houses. In a few days, there will be nothing but rubble. July 21st, 1944. Goodbye, Vienna, at least temporarily. Oh, how naive we were. 
Even after all these years of war, we haven't really understood yet that this is really war. Yesterday, they brought us to Elmshorn, a suburb of Hamburg. We protested. We insisted that we were students and we were on our way to Vienna. There must be a mistake here, we said. But the Germans looked at us and laughed. Vienna, they said, now you are here. And you will be here until we tell you. Germany doesn't need students. Germany needs workers. Every wheel for the victory. Soldiers took us to a war prisoners camp. They informed us that they will have that we will have to live and work with war prisoners. I tried to protest, but someone whispered that I shouldn't be too insistent because human life costs, uh, costs uh, little here. I remembered how one soldier hit Adolphus across the face in Dirschau when he left train to look for water. I immediately shut up. Herzlich willkommen im Haus der Kulturen der Welt zu diesem Abend, der aus meiner Sicht ein sehr spannender werden wird. Ich begrüße Sie in der großen Zahl. Wir haben gleich zwei Dinge heute Abend zu feiern. Einmal die Gegenwart von Jonas Mekas. Begrüßen Sie noch einmal mit mir Jonas Mekas. Wir eröffnen aber heute Abend auch ein Projekt unter dem Titel Wörterbuch der Gegenwart, das selbst zu einem Großprojekt gehört, das wir gerade begonnen haben, 100 Jahre Gegenwart. Sie werden nun sagen, es liegt auf der Hand, zu einem Thema wie 100 Jahre Gegenwart eine Persönlichkeit einzuladen, die selbst in ihrem Werk, in ihrem Leben fast diese Zahl erreicht hat. Das ist das offensichtliche Grund, warum wir Jonas Megas eingeladen haben. Aber es gibt auch noch einen systematischeren Grund. Und den äh, hat der Film, den Sie gleich am Anfang gesehen hat, eigentlich schon vorgeführt. Äh, Sie haben einen Ausschnitt aus Outtakes from the Life of a Happy Man gesehen. Ein Film, den Jonas Megas in 2012 gemacht hat, der aber wesentlich auf Bildern rekurriert, die in den Jahren 1960 bis 2000 gemacht wurden. Und ein wesentliches Thema des Films, das Sie sahen und Jonas Makers hat es immer wieder wiederholt, die Realität ist die Gegenwart. Auch diese Bilder, obwohl sie in den Jahren zwischen 1960 und 2000 gemacht wurden, also ältere sind, zu einem Archiv gehören, sie sind absolute Gegenwart. Und das ist die Art und Weise, wie wir 100 Jahre Gegenwart auch verstehen. Ein großer Möglichkeitsraum, unsere eigene Zeit zu verstehen, nicht sozusagen äh, uns historisch mit den letzten 100 Jahren äh, zu befassen. Ich habe jetzt die nicht einfache Aufgabe, Jonas Mekas vorzustellen, wissend, dass viele von ihm kennen, seine Arbeiten kennen und gleichzeitig ein Leben vorzustellen, das, wenn man nur die Filme sich angucken wird, äh, mehrere hundert Stunden dauern würde. Deshalb habe ich einfach zwei Zugriffe auf dieses Leben genommen, was vielleicht dieses Leben unter anderem kennzeichnet. Das eine ist das Erlernen von Sprache und das andere ist die po poetische Gestaltung einer Realität. Zum Erlernen von Sprachen hat äh, Jonas Mekas selbst äh, immer wieder eine sehr schöne Geschichte erzählt. Er ist ja in Litauen geboren worden im Jahr 1922 am 24. Dezember, also an Weihnachten, in einem kleinen Dorf und hat natürlich in diesem Dorf Litauisch gelernt. Als er dann zur Schule musste, merkte er, dass er eigentlich einen Dialekt gelernt hatte und die Sprache noch einmal lernen musste. Dann kamen später die Russen. Die Russen sagten zu ihm, Litauisch ist keine gute Sprache, du musst Russisch lernen. Also lernte er Russisch. Dann kamen die Deutschen und er lernte Deutsch. Und während er nach Wien reisen wollte, 
verschlug es ihn in ein Arbeitscamp in der Nähe von Hamburg, wo er nicht Deutsch, sondern eigentlich Plattdeutsch lernte und das zusammen mit Italienern, die eigentlich aus Sizilien kamen, sodass er merkte, er hatte viele Sprachen gelernt, aber äh, konnte nicht mit allen Leuten sprechen, die diese Sprachen sprachen. Und als er dann in, äh, mit seinem Bruder in New York ankam, äh, 1949, äh, hat er die Entscheidung getroffen, äh, Scheiße auf diese Sprachen, ich mache jetzt nur noch Filme. Und das Interessante war, als er dann mit seiner Bollex die ersten Filme äh, gemacht hat, äh, kamen Leute aus Hollywood, äh, die seine Filme sehen wollten und sich die Filme ansahen und sagten, was hast du da eigentlich gemacht, das sind doch gar keine Filme. So viel zum Erlernen von Sprachen und was Sprachen bedeuten im Leben von Jonas Makers. Er hat seit seiner Kindheit gleichzeitig auch ein Tagebuch geführt und als er nach New York kam, ich habe das schon erwähnt, eines der ersten Sachen, die er gemacht hat, war eine Bollex-Kamera zu kaufen und mit dem Filmen zu begann, äh, zu, äh, mit ihr zu filmen zu beginnen. Und da begann eigentlich das, was ich am Anfang nannte, äh, der zweite Aspekt seines Lebens, nämlich die poetische Erschaffung einer subjektiv erfahrenen Welt also einer Welt, deren Teil er selbst war. Und das bezog sich nicht nur auf das konkrete Filmemachen, sondern eigentlich hat er gleichzeitig eine ganze Filmkultur geschaffen. Ähm, als er merkte, dass für das Kino, äh, da, das ihn interessierte, keine Kritiken, äh, Kritiker da waren, schuf er eine Zeitschrift Film Culture 1954 mit seinem Bruder, äh, die die führende äh, Zeitschrift für Filmkultur in den äh, USA wurde für die New American Cinema, das sich immer, immer in gewisser Weise auch im Gegensatz zu Hollywood sah, äh, in einem seiner äh, Artikel für, äh, für diese Zeitschrift äh, schrieb er Hollywood oder die, The Commercial äh, Film, äh, Cinema is conventional and it's dead. Es gibt ein anderes schönes Quote, either you make films or you earn money. Ähm, dann, als klar wurde, dass äh, sich die Filme nicht automatisch in den USA äh, 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 gesehen werden konnte, hat er 1962 die Filmmakers Cooperative äh, gegründet, später die Filmmakers Cinematik. Er kuratierte ganze Filmprogramme permanent, neben dem Schreiben über Film. Und hat damit eigentlich so eine ganze Filmkultur geschaffen. Das, was New, äh, New American Cinema ist, ist teilweise äh, Teil seiner Kreation. Und Film als Medium diente ihm immer auch äh, dafür, mit seinen Freunden in Interaktion zu bleiben. Die Freunde sind Teil seiner Filme, teilweise Gegenstand seiner Filme. Oft spricht er mit den Freunden über diese Filme. Das, also das Medium Film ist sozusagen das Zentrum, aus dem heraus eine ganze Welt äh, entsteht und entstanden ist. Äh, und das über die Jahre bis heute, wie gesagt, wir haben äh, gerade äh, einen Film aus äh, dem Jahr 2012 äh, gesehen. So ist auch vielleicht dieser Abend zu verstehen als äh, sozusagen ein Zusammenkommen, um mit Jonas Mekas über seine Filme, aber auch über seine Poetry, äh, über seine Tagebücher zu sprechen. Herzlich willkommen noch einmal, Jonas Makers, und ich bitte Sie on stage. You go over there, or you just take the mic as you like. You can also walk, I don't mind. <laughs> yeah, let, let's uh, start the conversation uh, with a quote I very, like very much by the poet Oleg Yuryev. He was asked why he writes uh, poetry and his answer was, I am writing poems in order to find out what it is about. And my question to you is, when you started to film using your Bolex camera in New York, what were you searching for? What did you want to find out? I don't think I ever searched for anything, really. It always, uh, like, came <laughs> to me somehow. Uh, but, um, okay, 
he wrote poetry trying to uh, find out. Uh, I maybe wrote uh, poetry, I write poetry, and I film maybe in self-defense. Uh, living in this civilization, like I am constantly attacked by, by routine, by uh, corporate, by uh, 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 life that I don't even understand how one can live like that. I have to like create a completely different defense uh, I create my own uh, like reality, be it in film or poetry, in self-defense, so that I wouldn't. I have you know, like daily nervous breakdowns, but uh, just in, so that I wouldn't avoid, could avoid just a real devastation. Uh, in self-defense, yes, I do everything. <laughs> Uh, or in, like in Kung Fu, as a reaction. Yeah. I live and work like in Kung Fu style. Uh, there is this other quotation I like very much, saying, uh, form is not just form, it can be also resistance. So would you say the way you make films or the way you write poetry is a kind of political act, is a kind of real resistance against a system, a structure? It is definitely a political act, but it's not the politics which, uh, I'm not interested in politics which we usually in newspapers and television call, we call polit politics. Uh, I consider all those politics are negative, negative politics. I consider I am for the positive politics, those that change the living, the style of living, the, the, the essence of living of the society for the good. To me, the real politicians that have contributed during the last decades, five, six decades, which is part of my life, are uh, those who have given something positive and I can, like, uh, okay, like Buckminster Fuller, like John Cage, uh, like the Beat Generation, bringing us down to the down to reality from uh, artificiality. And uh, down the line, there, there are poets, scientists uh, that have contributed and changed, actually, the Beat Generation, Fluxus, are changing, giving something to us positive, while all the politicians are just using us, destroying my planet Earth. Uh, yes. Um, you said uh, when you use. So my, what oh, I do, sorry. I take a stand for beauty and for such, all those who live before me. All those who lived before me, all the poets, troubadours, all the scientists, all the, the saints, they did everything that humanity would become more subtle and more beautiful. So I cannot betray them. I take, I continue, I try to continue their work. I'm with them. I'm with you who lived before me and did every, everything that humanity would become more beautiful. Uh, in one context you said, uh, when you started to make films in New York, you thought you were making films about New York, and later on you realized they were films about yourself. Uh, in the German word Gegenwart, presence, there is this uh, aspect of gegen, there is something other beyond you. What does this other mean for you when you make films about yourself? 
You see, camera, camera, camera can record only what's in front of it, in front of the lens, and that the light can fall upon light. So it's always there. It's confrontation with this present moment, this now, this second. And uh, so, of course, that's all I can record, what is in front of me, in front of that lens, this very moment, now. And of course, my life is the same. I live, I can live on, in, in this second. I live in this second. The next second is already is, uh, is coming, and the, the, one, the present second is gone. So, of course, I'm uh, uh, trying to, to uh, what I'm recording is, is, is what I see, and what I see is determined by total myself what I am, what I want, what my total me wants that moment to see and feels like, oh, I should record this for, for some reason, which I do not know. It's irrational. It's not, uh, you cannot really, you know, exactly tell why I'm filming this. I never know. So, of course, we are dealing with this second, with this moment now. So imagine what responsibility is that knowing that this second determines the next second of uh, humanity? The butterfly wing, uh, the butterfly that flutters its wing in, in wings in China, and eventually the whole world was changed. And I'm not a butterfly even. I'm a human being with an, a whole of humanity is in me this very moment. I'm tiny, last leaf, not even a branch of humanity. So of course what I do this second, I have to be responsible in unconsciously for the, what I do second because the next moment, not only of my life, of humanity depends on it. Do we realize what responsibility that is for what we do this moment? In uh, Hornby's novel, High Fidelity, the protagonist... It's all real. It's, 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 what I'm saying is not a fantasy, you know, it's all real. It's not a theory. It's not a theory, not, a po not poetry. It's real this second for all of you, for all of us, and uh, what we do. Nevertheless, in Hornby's novel, High Fidelity, the protagonist says, I am very clear about the things after they had happened. The problem I have is to understand the now. Would you say you understand the now? In no, I your do not. I do not understand now because now includes all what I know and think uh, about uh, 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 humanity and everything around me this very moment. And I tell you, I don't understand the world at all, what's happening, why people do what they do today. And if, uh, I, I, it's beyond uh, understanding. It's so irrational. Uh, uh, what's happening today in the world in the big way and small way, daily. Uh, uh, I mean, what people buy <laughs> now, Christmas is coming, wow, what this circus all around, and, and what we eat, what we watch, what we look at, uh, it's beyond my, I don't understand uh, who, my fellow human, human beings at all. Uh. In uh, a lot of your films, you are using scenes which you did before. Uh, and we are going to see another film, Lost, 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 where you uh, can see uh, passages of, of films uh, from the 50s up to the 60s. Now, in the film we just saw, uh, the images are between 1960 and uh, 2000. 
And it's interesting that uh, the title of this last film we, we just saw was Life of a Happy Man, whereas in Lost, 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 you using to some extent a similar pool of images to describe the situation of a displaced person. Can you speak about this change and what it means to use these images, so to say, to contextualizing in different presences? See, when you leave your country or home uh, where you grow up as a child, then uh, you, you, and especially if it's like by force, not uh, when you leave by yourself to look for a better job, like uh, you can go to another country, have a, you know, make some money, then go back home anytime you wish. But when you are forced, then like you, 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 you keep thinking it's with you for years and years for all the refugees that now they're all around us. Uh, they, they are there with their own, they are still in, like in, uh, in their minds, in their emotions, they are uh, still in, the, 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 in their uh, home, uh, 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 countries where they grew up. So it's uh, unless you, uh, and it took me, it took me like maybe 15 years, maybe more, to really uh, understand and like uh, have my like second uh, birth. Like when you, you suddenly realize that, ah, Maybe I was lucky that actually I ended in the West. I was uprooted, yes, by force, and it was hard. And when I was still ed editing, lost, lost, lost. I not so. I was already somewhere else. I was almost grateful that I was uprooted, that I had access. That every, the world like began opening, and I was I was enriched. I began growing. And but uh, many of my compatriots and friends I knew they were still going through, through memories and suffering and could not break that and many of them die with those memories. So lost, lost, lost reflects that, uh, that very much. Uh, uh, while myself, if you see that film, those who will have chance to see, see that film is where it, I begin with myself also lost, but then slowly, slowly uh, begin to get into the new life in New York, different, uh, uh, meeting different you know, people and being like open, open to new possibilities in life. And by the end of the film, I am already somewhere else. I'm already like, uh, okay, reborn. I'm somewhere else. And the home, what's really home, becomes already uh, not so clear because the, the road is very open in front of me already. Yes. For, for your artistic practice, uh, the relationship between uh, having the camera in your hand and uh, uh, filming, and on the other side, uh, what we just saw in outtakes from a uh, life of a happy man, working in the editing room, working with images in the editing room, what kind of... Is there a big difference as far as your language is concerned, the way you approach images? The written uh, poetry is one thing, the poetry as an art uh, is one thing, and cinema is another thing, same as painting or dance or, or music. Each one has its own content, content its own tools, uh, uh, its own... Uh, uh, style, uh, uh, so that what I do in cinema is not what I do in poetry. It's a different content and uh, recorded with different tools. And so it's different, and of course, but it all comes, both come from me. Therefore, it's part of, part of me, but different aspects of me. Uh, and, and the relation between the filming part and the editing part. Filming mm. is I'm um, facing uh, reality there in front of me and, and recording whatever I'm recording 
And I said, I don't know why I'm recording. But when I later, later, when I now I'm sitting in my editing room, uh, life is that I filmed uh, videotaped, it's no longer there. Now I'm dealing, what I have in front are those images. So that's a new reality. I begin to deal with that reality of images. And they, so, uh, I look and look at them and uh, they begin to dictate sort of to me the shape, how it will, uh, and the shape that it wants to take uh, uh, and I just follow. I try to be very, very open to the, to to and listening uh, to my images, watching and be uh, that I don't, I don't push them into some wrong direction. So it's same irrational, not very rational processes when I film. Only that now, it's not live. I. I approach the same way the images themselves, mm -hmm. those pieces of mm -hmm. video or film, as, as new life, new now, new present moment. Okay, we go now in another present moment and continue the reading with I had nowhere to go. Thank you very much. Okay. October. 29th, 1949. Yesterday, about 10 p.m., the general uh, house uh, pulled into the Hudson River. We stood on the deck and we stared. 1,352 displaced persons stared at America. I'm still staring at it in my retinal memory. Neither the feeling nor the image can be described to one who hasn't gone through it, through this. All the wartime, post-war, displaced person, miseries, desperations and hopelessness, and then suddenly you are faced with a dream. You have to see New York at night from the Hudson like this to see its incredible beauty. And when I turned to Palisades, New Jersey, I saw the Ferris wheel all ablaze and the powerful searchlights were throwing beams into the clouds. Yes, this is America, and this is the 20th century, harbor and piers ablaze with lights and colors. The city lights merged with a sky that looked man-made. In the north, there was a massive cloud, then it thundered, and lightning cut through the cloud, uh, lighting it up briefly, and then falling on the city to be incorporated into the New York's lighting system. This gigantic manifestation of nature became just another neon sign. Early this morning, there was a heavy fog over the harbor the city appeared and disappeared. The Statue of Liberty appeared for a moment to greet us and disappeared in the mist again. Slowly the ship moved into the very heart of New York. The ocean was still in our ears, in our flesh. We were both dizzy and ecstatic as we touched the ground. According to the immigration papers, we had to board a train for Chicago. And that was our sincere intention. We had nowhere else to go. All this came to greet us and help us to the train station. 
We stood on the elevated platform at Pier 60, looking at the New York skyline. And we both said it at the same time, Adolphus and myself, we are staying right here. This is it. This is New York. This is the center of the world. <laughs> it would be crazy to go to Chicago when you are in New York. The decision was swift and final. We thought for a moment about our jobs in Chicago, the bakery and the apartment waiting for us, and all the good people who are ready to help us there. Security against plunging again into the unknown. And we looked again at the New York skyline, and we said, no. We aren't going anywhere anymore. We had enough traveling. We are staying here. Aldis agreed to put us up in his parents' apartment until we found jobs and a place of our own. We loaded our bundles into a taxi and proceeded to Brooklyn, to Meserol Street in the very heart of Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Oh, sing, Ulysses. Sing your travels. Tell where you have been. Tell what you have seen. And tell a story of a man who never wanted to leave his home, who was happy and lived among the people he knew and spoke which. Sing how then he was thrown out into the world. on. Father works in a factory. In the evening, the family gathers together around the table. Everything is normal. Everything is very normal. The only thing is, you will never know what they think. You will never know what a displaced person thinks in the evening and in New York.
Those were long, lonely evenings, long, lonely nights. There was a lot of walking, walking through the nights of Manhattan. I don't think I have ever been as lonely. So it goes, continues. The next uh, excerpt is from Reminiscences of a Journey to Lithuania, made uh, 20, some 25 years later, where I am already a little bit somewhere else. There is one uh, curious detail about this film, uh, that it was really, uh, before I went to, had a chance to go to Lithuania and film my old village and neighbors and my mother, to see my mother after 25 years, my bollocks broke down and I needed like uh, what I'm going to do. And I happened to be at that time, moment in Hamburg, visiting, I was there for opening of, of a new movie theater. I think Abaton, Abaton, Peter Zempel is here, he would know. Uh, and I discovered that my bollocks was broken. So somebody who was uh, in film production there, now I do not remember his name, said, I will buy you a new bollocks. Just permit me to premiere this film on German television. Fine, 
And he bought me a new bollocks, and I went with my new bollocks, and I filmed it, and when, then I went home, and got involved with the other things, and I forgot about the footage. Then, like just before Christmas in 71, I received a call from my humble, uh, generous television producer. He says, okay, the date is January uh, 5th or 6th, or somewhere there. Uh, please send me the film. The film, my film is, is on the shelf. In, in, uh, <laughs> I have not looked at that footage since I filmed it. I had three days to finish the film. When you have only three days, you don't make any, you know, big editing uh, decisions there. You just uh, have some simple formula and you go ahead and we just do it. And just, I just did it and the print arrived in time and it was premiered on German, uh, on uh, television uh, in Hamburg and I think later nationally. Uh, uh, so that's where the <laughs> premiere took place. But uh, uh, the you will see only the beginning of the film. That early fall in 1957 or 58, one Sunday morning, we went into the castles, into the woods. We walked through the leaves, beating the leaves with a stick. We walked up and up and deeper and deeper. It was good to walk like that and not to think, not to think anything about the last 10 years. And I was wondering myself that I could walk like this, not to think about the years of war, of hunger, of Brooklyn. And almost, in, maybe it was for the first time as we were walking through the woods that for early fall day. For the first time, I did not feel alone in America. Like I felt there was the ground, there was earth and leaves and trees and people. And like I was slowly becoming a part of it. There was a moment when I forgot my home. This was the beginning of my new home. Hey, I escaped the ropes of time once more, I said.
I walked the streets of Brooklyn, but the memories, the smells, the sounds that I was remembering were not from Brooklyn. Atlantic Avenue, somewhere there, they used to have their picnics. I used to watch them, the old immigrants and the new ones. And they looked to me like some sad, dying animals in a place they didn't exactly belong to, in a place they didn't recognize. They were there on the Atlantic Avenue, but they were completely somewhere else. Some footage I took with my first Borex. I wanted to make a film against war. I wanted to shout, to shout that there was a war. Because I walked the city and I thought nobody knew that there was a war. I thought nobody knew that there were homes in the world where people cannot sleep, where there are doors being kicked in at night with the boots of soldiers and the police somewhere where I came from. But in this city, nobody knew it. I remember you, my friend from displaced person camps, from the miserable post-war years. Yes, we are, we still are displaced persons, even, even today. And the world is full of us, every, continent is full of displaced persons. The minute we left, we started going home, and we are still going home. I am still on my journey home. 
We loved you, world, but you did lousy things to us. Have you, have you ever stood in Times Square and suddenly felt very close to you and very strong the smell of a fresh bark of a birch tree? My brother said, he was a pacifist and that he hated war. So they drafted him into the army and they took him back to Europe, back to all the war memories. So he started eating leaves from the trees and they thought he was crazy. So they shipped him back to the States. And there was Mama, 
And she was waiting. She was waiting for 25 years. And there was our uncle who told us to go west. Go, children, west and see the world. And so we went. And we are still going. The berries, always berries. Uagos, berries, uagos. The next uh, uh, you will see a uh, that originally is like a four monitor uh, installation called destruction quarter. Hmm? The next one will be wall. Oh yes, I made a mistake. The next one is Walden, an excerpt from Walden. Yes, uh, that's already uh, where uh, I think my, uh, I completed it in uh, 67, uh, where I felt like it's already this film in this film that my, all the techniques of uh, all my thinking and work about and with the diaristic form, like came, all came together. Um, so I do not know what part uh, uh, you will see, but um, I think it is uh, the moment, mid-60s, when uh, Velvet Underground uh, came into existence. And it was very, very busy, uh, intense uh, period, mid, like around six, uh, and the, the footage I think that you will see is 65, 66 where uh, so much was happening, everything was changing in all of the arts, and, uh, and of course that included cinema. So, uh, I guess, uh, take a look.
Here we are. Yeah, this yeah, pizza, pizza plaza.
think it was just before Christmas. They stood there. They stood there all day, all night. It was cold. It was coldest day of the year. They stood there, the women for peace. I stood on the corner of 42nd Street and I watched them. There were people passing by hurriedly. Nobody stopped. They were passing by. And so it continues. <laughs> um, next uh, is uh, Destruction Quartet. It's uh, a four, four monitor installation, usually that's how. Uh, uh, I think you will, I don't have, uh, okay, I mean, it's uh, uh, one monitor. You will see the uh, images of four monitors here on one screen. But uh, you, uh, it's the fall of the Berlin Wall, Namjoon Pike, uh, Namjoon Pike's piano piece, Destruction, quotation marks, okay, of piano. A young uh, Australian, uh, Lithuanian uh, 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 did a, um, is, is very much in the, was in fire, fire uh, uh, events. So a one uh, fire event in, uh, on the lower east side of New York. He came from Australia and did a p fire piece. And uh, of course, what's known as 9-11, the World uh, Trade uh, Center. So you will, uh, you will see that. I have not seen myself how it works when you put them all on four. So I may be surprised uh, I don't know how it will look, but that's what it will give you some idea. We can take a chance sometimes. Listen, <laughs> my child. Listen, my child, it was a horrible story. It was a horrible story, which I will never forget. I think people don't make a run on 
gourmet garage and get all the food they can eat. <laughs> the city's closed down.
live, I uh, film, I videotape. But I also, I mean, I do that during my, uh, the time when I'm awake. But then uh, sometimes I sleep. And sometimes I dream. There was a period of 10 months or so when I decided to keep a, uh, to write down my dreams. So this is, uh, I collected them in a book called My Night Life. This is August 10th, 1978. At the beginning of what I still remember, I was on a train or subway, and we were discussing the words substantial and consequential and I don't remember with whom I was discussing it, but it was time to leave the train and there were large crowds like in post-war Germany. Now I am in some unfamiliar field and there are other people here and somebody is translating Horatius Latin line, quid, quid agis prudenter agas et respice finem, as smash all the flower pots. And a girl goes and smashes the flower pots and somebody says, now you will have to pay for the broken pots but the girl is giving him an argument. So I say to myself, I will leave them alone and I will go and eat some green peas from the field just around the corner in our neighbor's field behind the new cemeteries. As I walked to the pea field, I noticed that somebody had increased the height of the cemetery wall by at least four feet, because I remember just before I left home years ago, we had built a low earth wall and we covered it with green grass. We put a lot of work into it, but now somebody's built this huge wall around it and it's a wall made of concrete. The peas were ripe, so I had some, and there was the old Marcius himself working in the field, and we spoke a couple of words, and then I went back home, which was like a post-war Hamburg, <coughs> which then, <coughs> Yes, um, and we spoke a couple of words, and then I went back home, which was like a post-war Hamburg section near Altona, all shambles. And I walked into the house which was still standing and in which I was living, at least so it seemed to me, and there was Hollis, and she was sitting on a chair by the table, typing or reading, I don't remember which, but the chair was like Richard Foreman's chair made for slanted floor. Also, it looked like a Van Gogh chair in one of the paintings, a chair made of thin willows, a wicker chair. Then I was in front of a huge building of which only one side was lit 
and I knew I was seeing only one side of it, or maybe even more correctly, only one part of the side because the, the rest was matted and the whole thing was underexposed. And we were in the woods and a voice repeatedly said, Hawaii, Hawaii. So I knew it was the Hawaii Hotel. But there were the, these three cowboys and we left the horses, but yes, but there were these three cowboys and we left the horses in the nearby woods in front of the hotel and we crawled a little bit further along the rails waiting for the train to come and we were hungry and I'm not sure whether was I one of them or I was being held by them but we ate together and I pulled out a chunk of raw smoked bacon like we had at home in Lithuania and we ate it and it was very good. Yes, I mean, this was uh, when 30, 20, 70, good, uh, many, many years later, but it's there, it's still there. At night, it all comes, somehow get, gets mixed up. Memories still invade in a very funny way, yes. But it's good to be somewhere else. We need nervous breakdowns. We need uh, some uprootedness and we, we need to be thrown into and out into things and places and situations which we do not know and we don't we even maybe we don't, do not even want to be there. But sometimes it's, it's, it's good to be uh, somewhere else. This is Christian Hiller. He is um, working as a curator at the Haus der Kultur in der Welt, or maybe not, I'm sorry. <laughs> but he's um, actually uh, the person who um, brought us in contact with Jonas Mekas. They've been knowing each other for a long time, and um, actually he was the one who had the idea also to bring him here to Berlin. And um, what else should I say? <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Anna. Thank you, Jonas. Um, thanks to Bernd Scherer, we can have this evening here. Jonas and me were in touch for many years, and um, yeah, we always thought about doing something together. And after 13 years, which is not such a long period of time in our lives, um, we have this evening here together. So, thanks for everyone. Jonas, thank you for sharing these moments, these glimpses, these outtakes with us. They are just a very small selection from an oeuvre that not only contains hundreds of books with poetry, reviews, interviews, statements, diaries, notes and sketches, thousands of hours of film and video, but also such acts as the co-funding of avant-garde film institutions like the Filmmakers Cinematheque, the Filmmakers Cooperative, the Anthology Film Archives, and art movements like the Beat Generation, Fluxus, and Pop Art. For tonight, we have chosen exactly these excerpts 
from your diaries and films because we think they can tell us something about the relationship between history and the present, establishing references between the past and the now. The first film, Outtakes from the Life of a Happy Man, was completed in 2012 and includes film material from 1960 till 2000, along with video footage that Jonas Makers recorded while editing the film and which shows him precisely during this process. In retrospect, he comments on the outtakes, small strips of film, scraps that remained from the editing process of his earlier film diaries. The film Lost, Lost, Lost consists of footage from the 1949 until 1963, which Mikas originally recorded for a documentary on the life of Lithuanian displaced persons. This was never realized and the recordings were finally used in Lost, Lost, Lost in 1976, a film which describes his own experience of displacement from a subjective perspective and his attempt to reorient himself in New York. Displacement is also a central theme in reminiscences of a journey to Lithuania, which was completed in 1972, four years before Lost, Lost, Lost. In the first part of the film, Mikas uses footage from 1950 until 1953, some of which he used in Lost, 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 although here it is placed in a different, more distanced, more optimistic perspective. The second part of the film shows the journey to his homeland, Lithuania, filmed in 1971. It is followed by footage from Hamburg, where Jonas lived in a forced labor camp, 1944 to 45, and pictures from a trip to Vienna, which should have already taken place in 1944, but never happened due to <coughs> his imprisonment. The film Walden was completed in 1969 as the first film of the series Diaries, Notes and Sketches. The film material used is from 1964 until 68, recorded close to the date of the final completion of the film. While Walden mainly deals with Mika's life as a member of the New York art scene, it also contains footage from the 50s described as memories <laughs> from the past such as the recordings of the Woman for Peace demonstration, which Mikas also used in Lost, Lost, Lost. Like the release dates of the recorded footage, the se sequencing of the recordings in the individual films um, is rarely chronological. The assembly of the film material generates temporal leaps, switching between earlier and later events. Sometimes material from the same scene appears at different parts within the sim same film or in different movies. In Mika's films, the past does not exist as a self-contained narrative. Instead, it is composed of a multitude of individual moments and instants. Temporal interleaving is generated by caption which plays specific events such as birthdays, marriages, New Year, dates, seasons, topographies, Brooklyn, Manhattan, Seminiske, in a new perspective, while filmed excerpts from diary, poetry, and notes recontextualize past situations. Tape recordings, conversations, and noises such as wind, rain, the sea, the subway, and the clatter of the Bolex camera and music from the record player, classical chorals, Lithuanian folk songs, or songs from musician friends, which can be heard in parallel to the images, along with jazz improvisations, and not least, the singing and accordion playing of Mikers. The music connects heterogeneous sequences of images, generating the mood of a particular period in time. Mika's voiceover commentary plays a central role, establishing the perspective from which he viewed and reflected on the recordings at the time of the film's completion, while simultaneously highlighting the gulf between different past and the present. There's no totality if at all the works pursue a logic of fragments, breaks, and scraps. 
the person of Jonas Mikas also reflects this fragment, fragmentary character. Jonas Mikas' subjectivity unfolds in his simultaneous role as author of the film and protagonist as narrator and originator of the images. His position as subject is located at different narrative levels, mixing, multiplying, and contradicting itself. These so-called diary films are not just related to one another. They are woven into the fabric of Jonas Mika's oeuvre. Jonas has used and explored the principle of the diary in different media, in collections of his written diaries, like I Had Nowhere to Go, in poems, music, installations, dream diaries, notebooks, and sketches. Different past moments coexist in the present. You can find this in the video work Destruction Quartet in the installation C365 Day Project presented here in the HKW on 12 monitors, one monitor for each month. The way Mikas experiences the clash of different past and the present becomes even clearer in the dream diaries where all experiences seem to mingle. In this polyphony of recordings, confronting and connecting the private and the public, the subjective and the documentary, an autobiographical space is created within which the individual history of Jonas Mikas and his friends, as well as contemporary history, unfolds. Despite his advanced age, Mikas has not, has not stopped questioning and reassembling these past presents. The way he recontextualizes the past is defined by the present moment, the here and now of Jonas Mikas. So, thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you for um, uh, not uh, being academic. You, I think you're pretty. Uh, uh. Okay. Um, so, um, yes. I now introduce um, Anne König, um, yeah, the publisher of this fantastic book scrapbook of the 60s um, yeah just recently available we are vex uh, specter books and um, the name scrapbook is something which says a lot i think about the concept of jonas how it, it works but maybe i keep yeah. this to you yeah. and it um, is it is a collection you see i have written a lot in, on cinema in film culture magazine and then for 20 years, I was uh, running the movie journal column in the Village Voice and in other places. But at the same time, uh, I wrote uh, very often, uh, sometimes for some other publications, sometimes for myself, on other arts, on uh, dance, performance arts, theater, uh, music. Uh, so. This book, this collection, scrapbook of the 60s, I think goes a little bit into the 70s and sort of continues. It's a, a collection of some of those pieces, not about cinema, but about other arts. Though there is one part that cl very closely connects with cinema. There's a large segment part on mixed media and expanded cinema. Expanded cinema, uh, uh, a lot of on some 30 different uh, artists working uh, with film, but also including and using all the other arts that we can name. And uh, um, in, uh, I did an, a survey. I had like 30 artists in uh, late 65, early 60. Six, uh, like I had a survey of, and there were 30 of them doing different, each one was doing something else. And there is a lot on that in this uh, book. 
uh, actual information that you cannot find anywhere else. Now, you know, when I wrote the village voice, all those columns, of course, it's, I started for the reason why I started it was to pass. There was so much happening, and, and nobody was bringing it, bringing it to the attention of the people. The newspapers, the, they, they ignored it. So uh, I had the chance, I was given this column, to bring all what the information about what was happening in the city and people. And I was excited about it. And I, I had to share it, tell, you know, I wanted to, others to see it. If I'm uh, excited about something, I want others to see it. So that's why uh, you will find some of that excitement. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes pretty irrational, maybe. In there. But may, may Thank I you for, you know. Maybe, maybe I just want to finish my um, introduction yes. to oh, yeah. Anne. No, no, <laughs> just, sorry. With, just with a brief quote about a new project she's doing. She's not only publishing books and uh, writing writings, but also works on an exhibition project next year um, at the F-Stop Festival in Leipzig. And I just want to quote the title because I think it's also relevant for how we can see this evening. And it's a quote by Andreas Neumeister. And it's, the end of the world as we know it is der Beginn einer Welt, die wir nicht kennen. So. <laughs> Good introduction. So now you don't know what to say. <laughs> no, no I, I can't do it better than Andreas did. Um, I just want to add something about the book we did together. Um, I would say half of the text uh, which we published now were unpublished. And um, my question now is um, Jonas, how did you uh, actually assemble this collection of texts and how much time did it take? to bring it together? <laughs> uh, it didn't take much time. Uh, I, I, um, my house is uh, very chaotic, but I know everything what I have in my house. And I have uh, a good memory of what I have written, though it's not published. It's scattered all, all over the place. And once, uh, I was offered this occasion, this, this chance of, uh, thank you, for, to publish. I just pulled out from one file, from, from one folder, another for uh, materials that I thought should be, should be uh, uh, contain information uh, about the period, what was done, and it's uh, some of it not that well known. There are some, you know, okay, you know, uh, Andy Warhol, okay, he's well known. But I think that what uh, I wrote, I was the first one actually to, to have a survey of his early work that was uh, in 1971 or somewhere there. And when everything was still available and it was like a fresh, uh, so it's, uh, uh, it's uh, like a different uh, view um, 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 a bit, uh, uh, yes, and also like, uh, from somebody who was in it and uh, not from the outside, but from inside. Yeah, I so mean, it has a, yeah, yeah. yeah, actually, it was something, I mean, we, have, we are speaking about texts of a time span of five decades, which is a lot, a long time. And when I read these texts for the first time, I would say half of the names, I never heard about it before. And um, so I had this idea to um, add an index at the end of the book in order to um, understand actually uh, what is uh, these texts about and um, who is talking to me. And when I ask you about this idea, you, s you sent me a quick email and you said, oh, what a crazy idea to do that. There are more than 300 names in this book. And, um, but you said, yeah, just go for it. So we did it. And um, this is actually also the moment where I have to say thank you to all people who worked with us at this book. Uh, it is um, the graphic designers, Pascal Storz and Fabian Bremer, and also Simon Cowper, 
who did a very good job at the end of the book. I mean, bookmaking is very similar to filmmaking, I would say. Uh, at the end, we are working through the nights. It's night work. <laughs> and we had, at the end, a lot of sleepless nights uh, to finish the book. But um, we finished it, and we are quite happy with it. And, um, yeah. I have one question about the book. So, because we are also thinking about um, talking about concepts of time. So, um, it's like named Scrapbook of the 60s, Writings from 1954 until 2010. This is somehow <laughs> contradictory. What, what is the idea behind this? So, oh. the, uh, the title? Oh, well, what yeah. is your question? Because I did not, that was not written by me, the dates. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, scrapbook is, is something casual and uh, at the same time uh, if something that you do also immediately after the event, uh, uh, it, it is part of the diaristic uh, scrapbook, uh, scraps that you jot down, you write down, uh, uh, they could be short, they could be longer, uh, it, it always, it's a diaristic form, form uh, like like a postcard is a form of a diary, or letters, uh, and memoirs, and confessions, and uh, ship logs, and uh, what farmers, when they keep the cal write down in the calendars, uh, when, when this and that, I did that and that. And these are all diaristic uh, different forms of, uh, of of the moment uh, uh, when it's happening, and yes, so it's scrapbook, and of course it it begins somewhere there, 54, very some very early um, uh, notes, and uh, some uh, there are a few much uh, later, but mostly it's 60s and uh, 70s, early 70s. But but what's the contradiction? I what do you, you mean, this big time span, or what's... No, but it's of the 60s, and then uh, scrapbook of the 60s, and then yeah. you have text from 54 <laughs> until... But maybe, okay. But the book is, <laughs> you that you are holding here is uh, now, and you will be reading it now, and you will be uh, reacting to what's written in it, uh, uh, all the information, or, or, or react my reactions to what I saw, you will be reacting to it now and to your own contemporary now, the mo uh, your perception your, uh, and uh, how you will see it will be now. So it's okay, it's six, that was long ago, 1954, uh, but it's uh, now, it's now. <laughs> no, I, yes, it's um, say, yeah. something written in the in 54 that you are uh, uh, reading about uh, now, and all that, of course, is gone. Uh, so uh, this is something that reality that is in front of you on that, on that page that there is. Um. No, no, it's come. I would like to ask one last question. Um, so, this book is, yeah, mainly about concepts of theatre, dance, and performance, and it deals very much with, yeah, a body experience. And when I was talking in my brief statement, I was talking about. Yeah, the past and different references in the past and relationships to the present. But maybe if I see your films again here on 60 millimeters, the most amazing thing in your work is like this capturing of a very precise moment. You use different techniques, most people know, about the single framing or condensation of time. Um, but how do you react with your camera, with your pen maybe, with your music to this just very short moment and 
maybe the second question related to it, does it, yeah, it seems like being a performance itself, how, how you work with the camera. I go through my life. I have my camera always with me. And uh, I do not know, I do not plan, I just ha to, to film or tape anything, I just carry my camera. And then there are moments as I go through my life when I feel this is, I have, I have to, to record this for myself. I have to record it. And, and, and it's not that I, I, I say that for, to myself this is important or this is, no, no. Uh, uh, I don't even say or think that I should be recording. Automatically, I just, without thinking, I take my camera and I begin to taping that moment. And uh, 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 that, that's all there is. And when I uh, uh, begin taping or filming, when I used my Bolex, it pulls me in and like uh, uh, it's a body. I react with my, uh, I, I, I mean, one thinks and perceives with one's whole body, not only with eyes and brain. Uh, it's, it's like with one's temperament, that's why I don't film in continuous, slow takes. I, uh, uh, I'm a, like, okay, I'm a nervous person. I'm a nervous wreck in some way, in, uh, in that sense, that I'm all in pieces, and I see everything in pieces and in, cer in a certain rhythm. It's not necessarily music. It's the same in that you write in single notes and you perform in single notes or... Uh, 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 but, uh, uh, it's the same when I feel I see reality and my fingers do the rest and uh, that way in a, uh, uh, through my temperament, through what I am. Uh, what else can I say? Uh, 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 uh. So, um, yeah, we're talking about time. Um, but We're running out of time this evening. No, <laughs> really uh, you cannot run out of time. Yeah, that's <laughs> not. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, 